of Jesus calling. Now is your special time. Come on forward and hear a story from Auntie Tari. Hey. 
Happy Sabbath, children. Oh, you're not happy. Happy Sabbath, children. Happy Sabbath, children. Who had a good breakfast today? Raise your hand. Ooh, okay, maybe put them down, Chris. Uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm going to tell you a very interesting story. Um, and that story uh, actually comes from a personal experience that happened a few weeks ago. So um, me and uh, three, little, three people that I live with um, decided to go on an adventure. So we wanted to go somewhere. Um, and I'll ask, um, yes. So we wanted to go somewhere uh, and um, we, we saw that it would be fun. Like we, we realized that we could get there by train, but there was one problem. From the train station to the place where we were going, it was about 13 kilometers, but not just an e easy 13 kilometer. It was very hilly. It's gonna be up and down. Have you ever gone for a walk? Like a very long walk? Like a very long walk? No, some haven't. Maybe 10 Ks. Those who are 13, those who are pathfinders, you're gonna have that opportunity at expedition to walk more than 30 Ks, okay? So don't worry. If you haven't experienced it yet, you will. So me and my friends, my three, my three friends, we sat in the train. It was five hours. I can tell you everyone was so excited while we were sitting in the train because we I had picked some extra food, you know, so we were eating and everyone was really happy. Then we got off the train, you know, we had already planned. So we knew about the walk and we had decided, you know what, we are experienced pathfinders. We're going to do the 13 Ks with our stuff on the back and it's going to be fine. So that's just uh, about 400 meters in. So you can see. There's um, Zion is at the back, and then the two people at the front, they probably were still eating something. Um, and we were still, you know, we still had a lot of energy. But while uh, I was taking that picture, I could feel that it is so hot. Have you ever gone on a walk when it's so hot? It's unbearable. Yes, you have? Yes, Maddie has. It's unbearable. And um, so we started walking, and... Uh, we waited for a bit just after, can you see that little white, um, just that little white thing, uh, that trailer? Um, when we got to that stage, uh, two of the people said their bags were not comfortable. So we stopped there for like five minutes trying to just get the bags comfortable. And while we were walking, I just realized in my heart, I could sense it that this is gonna be really, really hard, you know? And, um, you know, every time we talk about, you know, we need to pray. And, and so before we prayed, something amazing happened. There was a person who was driving the opposite direction. Uh, so he was going downhill while we were going uphill. And then he just stops. It was a young man and he was driving a car and he said to us, are you guys going all the way to the campsite? And we said, yes. And they said, in this heat, and we said, yes, because I had already checked there were no Ubers or anything. So we knew that this was the only option anyway at that time. And he's like, no, you know what? I can take you there. I said, oh, yeah, you know, I, I can pay. He said, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's going to be a really hot day. And mind you, it was also on my birthday. So I wanted to actually get there early so that I could enjoy my birthday. So what ended up happening, this young man, his name was Joshua. Uh, Joshua came out of the car, he parked on the corner, just kept, parked right in front of that white trailer because that's where we're still at. And then he took things that were in his car, packed them nicely at the back. And you can see we've got hiking bags, so it's really hard to fit in hi hiking bags in a small car, but they still fit anyway. And then he, he said, we got into the car, he started asking us a little bit more, so what, you know, what are you actually doing at the campsite? And I said, no, it's a church camp. And he said, oh, I'm not religious or anything like that. Um, but yeah, but I would really like, if you wanna come back, I would really like to give you a lift back as well. And uh, they exchanged phone numbers with JJ and we, we just talked all the way and he showed us where he lived, which was just on the way um, he, we passed by his house going to the campsite. You know, when, I, when, when we had that experience, there's a strong, there's a verse that came into my mind. 
um, it says, um, you can show the second picture. Um, the second picture is when we actually arrived. You can see the smiling faces, right? I don't think we would have had smiling faces if we had walked the whole 13 Ks. I think the, faith, the outlook would have been very, very different. Um, but praise God, we had smiling faces because we got a lift. Um, there's a verse that I, I read in the Bible. It says, Isaiah 65, 24. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speak, still speaking, I will hear. Do you know that um, to God, even though you're a child, you're not an afterthought. Every single thing that happens, God has already things in store, planned for you. And sometimes before you even ask, he will already answer. It kind of made me think about people in the Bible, like the children of Israel. You know, I'm sure God knew the direction that they were going. There was going to be this big sea that needed to be parted, right? Do you think God just struggled and said, oh, what am I going to do now? I'm stuck. Do you think God did that? No, he has an answer for everything. He already has a, a plan for you. So I just want to encourage you with the story and say, uh, God is still in the business of answering prayers. And sometimes before we even ask, he's the same God who answered Joshua's prayer and the sun stood still. So he's still in the business of making the sun stand still if we want to. He's still in the business of healing. He's the same God who healed Naaman. So if you are sick, you can still ask God because he's still in the business of healing. He's already saying, you just ask me and I will answer. So may God help us as you as little people, whatever you want to do, don't be afraid. God is still in the business of answering prayers. And sometimes before we even ask, he knows exactly what we need. All right, let us close our eyes and pray. Precious Father in heaven. Lord, thank you so much for reminding us that um, you are an ever-present Father and you are a God who sees us. Lord, at the times where the whole world will not see us, when we're going through a, a, a hard time as little kids in school, at home, or any other place, even in friendships, God, I praise you because you see us. Lord, as we um, uh, jump into the uh, adult, uh, the divine service, Lord, I really want to pray for all the little kids that are sitting here that may you give us the patience to be able to sit quietly and listen to the preacher and understand. Um, and if we have any questions, we can even ask uh, the preacher after he, pre he finishes uh, so that we can know more, so that we can share with others the good news. And when everything has been said and done, Father, I pray that all our names will be written in the book of life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, it's time for tithes and offerings. Um, like I mentioned before, we have these tokens for you give us to put in the baskets uh, if you need to. Uh, this week, our tithes and offerings are going towards our personal ministry and uh, in which um, uh, uh, ministry. Uh, it's all going to be under the local church budget. Uh, there are a few ways to give. There are some uh, envelopes in front of the pews. Make use of those. Uh, or you can go on the uh, website and uh, go on the e-giving site uh, and make your donations from there. Or easily you can just scan the uh, uh, QR code there and uh, that will lead you to the uh, e-giving. Just make sure to choose Amishon Church in the northern uh, Northern South Wales um, Conference. Um, and here it says, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Second Corinthians verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 7. Um, and remember, it's a free will offering. Uh, and as the deacons are about to come around, I'll just pray before they make the collection. Let's pray. To our Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we want to thank you for the gifts that you continue to shower upon us. Uh, bless us um, as we help towards your work and let uh, the little that we have uh, given multiply and yield uh, in abundance in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. Uh, this morning, uh, Bible reading is uh, on Acts chapter 2, verse 41. <clears throat> and it reads, Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And uh, the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We praise the Lord for that. For those who are able, I will ask you to kneel in prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we come before you as uh, your children. None of us are worthy to be here, Lord. It is only to your grace and to your love that we're here. We ask you day by day to uh, help our, guide us with your Holy Spirit to do what is right, because it is right. Give us new hearts and new minds. Give us the gift of forgiveness. Give us the gift of repentance. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. We thank you for all the blessings that you give this, uh, this church. We thank you for uh, the wonderful message that we have to give. We, have, uh, we thank you for uh, the three angels message that is the last message to a dying world. We thank you for all the ministries uh, that uh, are working in this church. And I especially think of uh, uh, the children's ministries and uh, Tari and the wonderful job she's doing with the children. May you bless her abundantly and bless the children uh, to uh, as they grow day by day to grow into thy likeness. <clears throat> we thank you for the daily little miracles that the, you do for us and uh, we're uh, so Pleased to hear that uh, the wonderful little miracle you did for Tari and the children as they were walking up and you allowed them to have a ride in a very hot day. We thank you for uh, when the clouds uh, come over sometimes and uh, hide us from the terrible heat of the sun. We thank you that you love us, Lord. Help us to be faithful in all things. We pray for all the parents that are here, that you may bless them and guide them in doing what is uh, right for their children. Help us all to be uh, obedient to you and to be good examples. Help us all to uh, be worthy of our calling. Put in our hearts a missionary spirit that we may want to do the work that you have given us and finish the work that you may come and take all your people home. 
Now bless uh, Pastor Justin as he takes the sermon and let these words be words from uh, uh, from the oven of heaven. And uh, bless all the mothers here and uh, guide them day by day in the wonderful work they do for the children. So, so we ask, keep us faithful. Thank you for every day that you give us. Thank you for the blessings of living in Australia while, the, while things are going well. All praises go to you. And we say these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning, friends. It is good to be with you this morning. Um, it is it is very good to be with you this morning. And testing, testing. Is there a little bit of feedback? Yeah. Is it a little bit better? Yeah. No? Getting there. It's all right. Because I'm about to get louder in a little while, George. So maybe we'll. Uh... By the way, George has recently stepped into uh, serving on the AV team. George, thank you so much for being willing to step in and step up. Very exciting that uh, the team there is growing. As um, I often say, they're the most powerful people in the church because, you know, they control the power, the mics, the... You get it? Okay. Some people understand. It is very good to be with you today, and, and uh, we're missing two people that were sitting right about there most Sabbaths for the last um, two Sabbaths, and that is my parents, my mom and dad, Hovik and Edie. I am, uh, yeah, we are sad that they have had, had to head back to the United States where they live and where life is for them, but what a beautiful time we had together as they got to meet their first grandchild and spend time with uh, Sharissa and I and baby Judah. And so mom and dad, I know you're probably watching on Friday night. May the Lord bless you for the blessing that you guys were to us in your time here. Wanted to highlight just a few things before we dive into our message, which is called All of Act. And uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But um, next Saturday night, seven o'clock, when? 7 p.m. When? What day? Next Saturday night, yes, we have a concert uh, by Hayden Wiseman and also Sam and May Chit. May will be uh, singing uh, three items, and Sam will be accompanying um, Hayden on a few of his pieces uh, that he will be performing for us. Hayden is uh, doing a tour around Australia, and this is a golden opportunity to come and be blessed. Let your, your children, the young people in our congregation who are musically minded or even maybe not musically minded, come and let your brains be expanded by the beautiful godly music. Also invite some friends and family members. It's so much easier to invite people to a concert than it is to a church worship service at times, especially in our secular culture here in Australia. So please feel free to invite family members, neighbors, friends, co-workers, and uh, be blessed. Next Saturday night, what time? 7 p.m. Very good. Um, wanted also to just mention that, uh, ah, yes, I mentioned earlier in Sabbath School preliminaries for those who were here that um, how many of you were blessed by Robert Panacoke's ministry while Robert was with us for the last year, a little more than a year? All right. Well, we have been blessed again. Robert is uh, no longer with us this year, sadly, but uh, God has opened up other doors for him. But we are blessed with, uh, with another student I mentioned this morning, and uh, that is Rod Mallet. Rod, go ahead and raise your hand, and his wife, Alice, and their daughter, Zoe. And I was extra blessed. We're doubly blessed this year because just after that, um, Rod's, uh, Rodney's um, fellow student, Erwin, shared with me that he and his wife, Anna, will be joining us as well this upcoming year with their precious two children as well. Guys, go ahead and raise your hands too. So please, if you haven't met uh, Erwin and Anna, Rodney and Alice yet, please do introduce yourselves to them as uh, we will be very blessed by having them with us for the next year. And who knows, maybe they might even stay on longer than a year if we treat them well enough, guys. So, you know, but um, we're very blessed. Thank you guys for allowing the Lord to lead you here because 
Uh, we will be tremendously blessed by your presence and your willingness to work for the Lord and um, as he has called you both to full-time ministry and you four, really, because ministry is a team effort. Amen. Wanted to just highlight before we pray and dive into our message that um, April 1, that is one month from today, well, yeah, four Sabbaths from today, April 1, uh, we're not only having a very special international lunch, but an international Sabbath. How many of you enjoyed the international Sabbath last year? Oh, man, I think that everybody kept saying, and Tari was saying, can't we just have one like once a month? <laughs> and in a sense, every, you know, every Sabbath is an international Sabbath for us here. But we're going to have an international Sabbath, and we don't want a single, um, a single culture or language left out. So please speak with me after the service. I'd love to involve you in either a scripture reading or a special item that you could sing for us, maybe with the group or maybe use solo. Uh, if you uh, are a solo singer, and um, we will have wonderful food. You can wear your traditional cultural dress from your country of what is worn to church in your home country, and uh, we'll be tremendously blessed by celebrating together the, the multicultural church God has blessed us with here in Hamilton that is truly a foretaste of heaven to come, and so please plan on that uh, April 1. We have some time uh, to plan on that. I should just mention this before we pray and jump in, and that is that Sunday before last, we had a wonderful social time together at Macquarie College. We're grateful to Macquarie College for letting us use their sports center. We had 48 people who came from our church family to, to enjoy some games and some interaction together, uh, a pizza dinner. And I'm bringing this up just to say that there are many more times like this to come with our incoming social committee including a social event this year, a 100th birthday celebration for Alma, who is one of our you know, longtime church members but hasn't been with us for the past year and a half or so because of COVID and, and her health. I, her health is good, but you know, trying to protect her health. So many, many more social times to come. And during the sermon, you'll hear about some of the other things that we have to come uh, here in the upcoming year. All right. All of Acts. Friends, we have a huge message. Um, I didn't say a long message, but a huge message because it's trying to cover the entire, not trying, we're going to cover the entire book of Acts in one sermon. So it is a, a big overview. And um, I, was, I had the privilege of, of doing a field school of evangelism with Pastor Mark Finley in 2015 in, in um, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, he has inspired this message as he did an overview of the book of Acts with us all within an hour and a half. But um, we will not be here for an hour and a half hearing my message. Uh, so fear not. But um, yes, Pastor Mark Finley, true man of God, walks with Jesus. He and his wife, Teeny, Teeny God has used them in absolutely miraculous ways. And so, yeah, he inspired this message. And so all of the book of Acts, in one message. Some of the chapters will only have a brief mention of like a half a sentence, but other chapters we'll dig into and dive into as we seek to know what the Lord would have us do as a church as we're really starting a new year with nominating committee finishing up and um, starting a new year with our leaders and our officers and our ministries here at Hamilton. Let's bow our heads together and ask the Lord's blessing upon us as we feed on his word. Father in heaven, we thank you so much because you have given us your word, which you've told us is as a light shining in a dark place. And Lord, we see the increasing darkness in the world around us. And we have come this morning because we want to hear from our heavenly father. We want to hear from your word, which is a light that we can take from this place to share with those who are still in darkness. We thank you for Jesus, who is the light of the world, the light of life. And Lord, we ask that he would shine in our hearts more brightly by the end of this message, because we have seen him uplifted and we have heard your voice through the written word. May the living word dwell in our hearts and may you use us this week to bring others to you. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All of Acts, all of Acts. The sermon is titled All of Acts for more than one reason. 
And we'll get to the second reason at the end of the message of why it is called all of Acts. Not just because our message is covering all of Acts, but there is an additional reason. Before we start, and grab a Bible. There should be one in the pew in front of you if you did not bring yours from home. And uh, if you do not have a personal Bible that you use and you love using, speak to me after the service because we would love to gift you with a beautiful Bible that uh, you can use and treasure and um, really enjoy if you don't have one yet. Just as we dive into the book of Acts, and before we do, how many of you here today, by a show of hands, would love to see our church here at Hamilton, the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, packed with people every Sabbath again, most of them seekers from the community? Raise your hand if, if you would love to see that. Church packed. You come five minutes late, it's hard to find a seat. Mostly people from the community. Praise God. How many of you would like to see baptisms every single Sabbath of the year? Raise your hand. That's something you'd love to see. Third and finally, how many of you would like to see Pentecost happen again with the miracles that happened in the early church uh, taking place today in our church and in your life? How many of you would like to see that? Praise God. Now, in the New Testament church, Throughout the book of Acts, and we're going to dive into the book of Acts, but before we do, I just want to share with you four things that the believers were involved in. And actually, we will see this from Acts. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. This is just setting it up before we have the overview and start back at chapter 1 and fly through. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. What does this verse tell us? They realized that the disciples, untrained, uneducated in technical schools of the day, but that didn't matter. They were speaking with power and authority and skill. Why? Because they'd been with who? Because they'd been with Jesus. The first thing that we see consistent with the, the early New Testament church, and um, George, if I could maybe just have the... Audio turned up just a smidge because I, I otherwise will be preaching a bit too much. And Sharissa and I are doing a relationship panel discussion at Waitara Church this afternoon. So I um, want to save my voice a bit for that. Thank you, George. That's better. Acts 4.13 tells us that the believers in the book of Acts had a meaningful devotional life. Do you see that from the verse? People could tell that they had been with who? With Jesus. It's not just talking about they had been with Jesus before he ascended to heaven and physically walked and talked with him. This verse is saying they had that morning spent time with Jesus. The people could see that the early Christian church, the, they were followers of Jesus and had a meaningful devotional life. The second thing is that the early Christian church was a spiritual network of small groups in house-to-house -house fellowship. Go back to Acts chapter 2 with me. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Raphael read that beautifully for us. It says, and we'll come to it in a little bit, those who gladly received Peter's word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. The breaking of what? The breaking of bread and in prayers. Going on. It says, um, verse 43, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Beautiful. People sold their houses and said, brother, you're in debt. I'm going to help pay for your debt by selling one of my houses. I don't need three houses. And God moved upon their hearts and they did this. And we're going to see a repeat of this at the end of time. It says in verse 46, so continuing daily, how often? Daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Friends, they were daily in each other's homes, spending time together, speaking about God and his word, sharing his word, what they had learned from his word recently, sharing about life, about their witnessing experiences to their friends, to their neighbors, to their family members. So we see that the early Christian church, they had a devotional life, a personal devotional life. 
Secondly, they were a spiritual network of small groups in house-to-house fellowship. We're going to see, and I'm going to share a little bit later, but we're going to see more of this this year here at Hamilton. More house-to-house fellowship and opportunities to fellowship in each other's homes. Third of all, they experienced corporate worship and praise through Sabbath worship and through biblical preaching. Verse 46 tells us that they went to the temple daily. So not just on Sabbaths, but they went up to the temple daily and they worshiped together. Fourth and finally, we see that the early Christian church, if you look at Acts 6 verse 7, it tells us that they were an active community, active in community involvement. They were involved in reaching their community and witnessing to their community through uh, sharing their faith in practical ways. Acts 6 verse 7 says, The word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Why? Because they were feeding people. They were actually providing food for those who were in need. Do you think that's something we should do today if we are capable and able in our local area? What do you think? Should we provide food for those who are in need of food? Yes or no? If the early church did it, and we can, why not, right? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And when they know how much you care for them and care about them, they will want to know, why are you doing this? Why do you care for us? And then they'll want to know what you have to share. Friends, this opens up doors. And this is what God's plan is. Um, They were active in their community. There is a church, the fastest growing church in the North America division. This was seven years ago. There may be a faster growing one now, but it's in Vancouver, British Columbia. You know why the church there is the most active or the the fastest growing church in all of North America? Check this out. This is what they do. They purchased a plot of land next to their church. They built a garage and they said, we're going to do free oil changes and brake pad changes for single moms and people who are in need and can't afford to change the oil on their cars. As a result, the people are like, what else do you guys have happening? Because we'd love to to see what else you have going on in your church. But in addition to that, and this is even bigger, check this out. Every single year, this church builds a $200,000 house for someone in the community, a poor family in the community who is living in a beat up, run down house or or has lost their home. A $200,000 house every single year. Amazing, right? And as they stepped out in faith, the Lord started blessing them with the funds to be able to do this. Friends, our churches, in order to reach our community, we must show the love of Christ in practical ways. Not just telling them, God bless you, be fed and, you know, be warm. But as the book of James says, no, providing food and clothing and the practical needs of life by showing them God's blessings instead of just saying, oh, yeah, God bless you, I'll pray for you. Practical Christianity. That's what the New Testament church was about. And listen to this. Testimonies, volume 8, page 19 says, The church beheld converts flocking to her from all directions. Backsliders were reconverted. Sinners were united with believers in seeking the pearl of great price. Who's the pearl of great price? Remember the parable Jesus told of the pearl of great price? The pearl represents who? Jesus, that's right. The pearl represents Christ. People were seeking Christ. Friends, the New Testament church was characterized by a relentless love. A love for people that was relentless. And why was this significant? Because God's love for us is relentless. God does not let up. He does not back away from his pursuing us with his love. And his promise is sure. God says that before Jesus comes again, Just before, there will be a repeat of Pentecost, what happened in the book of Acts, in the beginning of the book of Acts, that sparked the revival and really the greatest revival history has seen. But the Bible tells us in Bible prophecy that the latter reign will make the early Christian church, the former reign, look like it was small compared to what God does at the end of time. Isn't that amazing? Like, I cannot wait to see the miracles that God works. Because today, as we look through Acts, we're going to see some of the miracles and the things that God did. And it's hard to wrap our brains around what more God could do that would be more amazing than what we find in the book of Acts. All right, that was just an introduction. Now we're ready to start. Acts chapter 1. 
Acts chapter 1, we see Jesus tells them, you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8, or verse 6. Excuse me, verse 8. After he promises that the Holy Spirit will come with power and they will receive power, he says, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That is concentric circles, by the way. Jerusalem is at the center of that. And then he says, uh, Judea, that's the area Jerusalem is in, and then Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. The message is, start where you are. God wants you to start where you are. Not so you don't, don't feel like, resist the urge to think, oh, you have to fly across the world in order to do something special for God. God wants you to start right where you are, where you have friends and family members who don't know him. The Bible says Jesus then ascended to heaven. He, he rose up out of the into the sky, got smaller and smaller and smaller until a cloud received him out of their sight. It was a cloud of angels. And the Bible tells us that now they said, we need to pray. They went to the upper room and they prayed. The Bible says before that or after that, they came together and they chose the 12th apostle to replace Judas, who had ended his own life. Now, Acts chapter 2, the Bible tells us that they were all assembled in the upper room. They were praying. They had set aside their differences. They had apologized to each other and asked forgiveness for the ways that they had wronged each other, for seeking to be the greatest and putting down their brothers and, and putting themselves up. And the Bible tells us that when they did this, when they had humbled their hearts, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That word one accord is hamathumadon, which means to rush along together in unison, like an orchestra. Different instruments, all being necessary, but being directed by the conductor. This is the picture of the word one accord, hamathumadon in Greek. And it says there was a, a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I remember seeing a Book of Acts movie when I was a kid, and I can still picture whoosh, the doors break open and, and their hair is flying in the wind. But the Bible doesn't say there was wind. What does it say? The sounds of a mighty rushing wind. Ah, they missed that when they put together the movie. And it says, Then there appeared to them dividing tongues of, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There were over 18 different languages that are listed there where people were hearing them speak in their native language. You know, I used to tell people, if I could have one gift, like if God came to me like he did to Solomon, and he said, Justin, you can have any gift that you want, what is it? I would tell him, I'd love to be able to speak every single language, every single dialect in the whole world fluently. Because there's no better way to connect with people than knowing their home language, being able to speak to them and connect with them. We're going to see a little bit of that in our International Sabbath coming up on April 1. The Bible says that God, who, who created the division of languages with the Tower of Babel, now bridged that gap in order for the gospel to go to all of the world. You see, there were people gathered in Jerusalem at this point from all different countries and locations. And God was intentional about this. They said, oh, these men are drunk. Peter stood up and started preaching and said, no, they are not drunk. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy of the early rain, the Holy Spirit being poured out. The Bible says that at the end of this sermon, it says in verse 40, 38, uh, verse backing up a little bit, it says in verse 37 that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. And the Bible says that this happened. In verse 41, it says, Those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Friends, the, the morning they woke up, that morning when they woke up at Pentecost, there were 120 of them. When they went to sleep that night, there were 3,120 of them. Isn't that incredible? God multiplied the church by over 20 times. And some quick mathematician could probably give me the number of times it was multiplied. God's desire was clear. He wanted to multiply his church. There are four Ps in the book of Acts. How many? 
Four Ps. When you get your license in Australia, you have two Ps. Red Ps, green Ps, and then your license, right? Book of Acts has twice as many. Four Ps that summarize what the believers did in the book of Acts. First of all, they were people of prayer. They were people of what? Of prayer. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and God, God answered their prayers. We're going to see that in our message. Secondly, they were people of passion. People of what? Passion in a positive way. Positive passion. Amen? Passion to serve God and to share God in practical ways. They knew and recognized that God had called them and they were on fire and had a passion like we should today for what we are doing. Friends, when we are on fire for Christ, we will recognize that God has given us a mission and you'll realize God has, wants you to be a missionary. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, to transform your community for Christ. If we don't believe that God has called us to a specific community to make a difference, then we won't. You follow? If we don't believe that God's going to use us to reach a community, then we definitely won't. It's called the self-fulfilling prophecy syndrome, where you say something negative and it ends up happening because it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if we have faith-based optimism and we recognize that God wants to use us now, not, not wait until we're better, we're more holy down the line, and then we, God can use us. No, God wants to start using us right now. And as he does, we will be purified and changed and transformed. Friends, God wants to use us. We see there were people of prayer. There were people with a passion. There were people of proclamation. They proclaimed the gospel. That's the third P. They preached and proclaimed the gospel. They taught. They shared it one-on-one -on -one in conversations with people. And fourth of all, the early Christian church were people of priority. They made God the number one priority in their lives. They put him first above everything. They put priority on the word of God in their personal lives. And they put priority on the work of God in their public lives. God was the number one priority of the people of God in the book of Acts. We see that there is tremendous growth in Acts. And as a result, it was a result of their prayers, their proclamation, their passion, and because they made God the number one priority. Acts 4 verse 4, moving along. Acts 3, a lame man is healed. Powerful story. We don't have time for it. Acts 4 verse 4, moving on, says, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. The number of men was 5,000. What do you guesstimate the number of women would have been? 5,000? You think that's fair to say? Probably. Sister, wife, etc. Number of men were 5,000. The number of women would have been around 5,000. Acts 4 verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together had sh was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Powerful. Three things. They pray, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they speak the word of God with boldness. Friends, witnessing is always connected to revival. Revival amongst God's people is always connected to witnessing. And we're going to talk a bit more about this later, but we see this in the book of Acts. As they, as they are revived, they witness. And as they witness to people, they are revived, and the revival continues, and they stay on fire for the Lord. You know, it is a, a strong inspiration to be walking with God when you're going to be giving a Bible study to someone for the first time, or the second time, or the hundredth time, and you want to be a clear channel for God to use to reach them. Acts 5, verse 42, flying along, and we'll start moving a little more quickly here. Acts 5, verse 42, the Bible says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Friends, every single day, not once a week, every day, they were witnessing and sharing their faith with others. An early pagan historian said this, he said, they proclaimed the gospel with the ardor of a revolutionary. <laughs> Pretty strong words, right? Acts 5, verses 14 and 16 tell us that there were miracles that accompanied what they were doing. Check this out. This is mind-blowing. Acts 5, 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets 
and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. The very shadow of Peter passing by and falling on some of these people because of Peter's connection to Jesus and infilling of the Holy Spirit and because of these people's faith that if they just brought their loved one into the shadow of Peter who was connected to Jesus, they would be healed. God was working miracles of healing in people's lives. Isn't that incredible? We're going to see in Acts 19 a little bit later that there were other miracles that were being worked. I'll just tell you now, a handkerchief from the Apostle Paul was taken to a person who was sick. And because of faith in the Jesus who Paul served, that person was miraculously healed. And this would have caused many, many people to be converted to say, wow, these pagan gods we've been worshiping are nothing compared to the power of the God of the Christian church, Jesus, the power of Christ, the power of Yahweh. The Bible goes on, it says in Acts chapter 6, just going quickly, that deacons were chosen for the divvying up of the food amongst the people who were there so that the apostles could focus on the preaching of the word and the study of the word. And friends, we have got some, uh, with nominating committee happening right now, we have got various positions open and available, areas to serve in our church. And let me say this, every single position is important. Every position is actually essential to the proper functioning of the church. Um, absolutely important. And God wants you to serve in some way in this year, no doubt. Be praying about how he wants you to serve. Stephen, one of the deacons, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's debating with some of the, the, those in the synagogue, and they cannot resist the wisdom with which he speaks. They cannot answer him because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the last verse, verse 15, that they looked at him and his face was lit up like an angel. His face was bright with the light of heaven. He preaches in Acts 7. He's stoned to death. At his death, uh, Paul, or Saul, is consenting to his death. The Bible says that his death was a witness to Paul, to Saul, who became Paul. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Is this too fast or should I speed up a little bit? It's all right. Everybody following? Pew belts are still buckled. Okay. We're trying to end this, land this plane in time for lunch. Um, it's not going to go anywhere if we don't, but I want to to finish it at a certain time. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Acts chapter 8, there's a tremendous harvest reaped in Samaria. Verse 4 is a fulfillment of the promise of Jesus in Acts 1 as to where they should go. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. They actually literally go to Samaria as Jesus promised that they would. Acts 8 verse 27, Philip runs up next to this Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch decides that he wants to be baptized when he hears that the Messiah has come. By the way, sometimes people say, can I just be baptized like the same Sabbath I come forward for an appeal? And the answer when they point to verses like this is, this man, this Ethiopian eunuch, had understood everything up until that point. He had one more bit of truth to learn, and that was that Jesus the Messiah had come. He was now fully ready to be baptized. And so sometimes in ministry, people come to you who are fully ready to be baptized. We had one um, last year or year before last. Thomas, or Abel, he came to me, and he attended church a few times, and he said, Pastor, he said, I listened to a full evangelistic series by David Asherick a few years ago, and he said, I made a decision to give my life to Jesus in baptism, but I, I then wandered, I, I delayed, and I didn't do that, and he said, now I know God is calling me. We ran through a few of the Bible's core teachings, and I said, brother, you're familiar with the core teachings of Scripture. And so he was baptized with George and Greg, actually. I think it was, George, what was the date of your baptism? June 5, 2021? I think it was June 5 or July 5. June 5. And we praise God for that. And so we see experiences and things like this today. Abel or Thomas has been away on a, uh, you know, in an internship up in Queensland. But now that he's back for the semester with school, we can look forward to him joining us again by God's grace. Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is reached. Why did God want an Ethiopian eunuch reached? Of, of anybody that he could reach in Africa, why an Ethiopian eunuch? 
who was the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia, by the way. What was that? Yes, he could preach the gospel. He could take the gospel to the queen of Ethiopia. But in addition to this, Ethiopia was the center, was essential to trade routes to Africa. Um, all of the African nations that, that worked out trade between Asia and, and Europe, they went through Ethiopia. And so God was being strategic here with who he was bringing to him. Acts of the Apostles 109, powerful quote, one of my favorites. Listen to this. All over the world, not just in Hamilton, Hamilton included, yes, all over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, and for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. Isn't that beautiful? Friends, there are people in our neighborhood here who are just on the verge of God's kingdom. They just need a friend who knows a little more of the truth of God's word than they do to be gathered into his kingdom. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied to stay within our walls. I can't wait this year to get out there on the doors and knock on people's doors and share things in letterboxes to invite people to be a part of a worldwide family of faith. You know, Christianity spread throughout Africa, including the truth of the Sabbath. Ghana is an example of this. Um, if you're born a boy in Ghana, you name him after that day. And so a child born on Saturday is Kwame. It literally means one belonging to the Creator. Why? Because the Sabbath is a memorial of the Creator. And uh, interestingly, when, um, when you are born on a Sunday, you are called Kwasi because Kwasi literally means foreigner or the foreigner. So if I was in Ghana and I was walking down the street, they would call me Kwasi Brune, which means white foreigner. Um, so why is someone born on Sunday called foreigner? Because Sunday as a holy day was unknown, completely unknown to the people of Ghana until the foreigner came and introduced it as a holy day. So the truth of the Sabbath was, was taught as well. And through Ethiopia, many African nations, this is just one of many examples that we see in Africa of Sabbath-keeping groups of Christians. God knew exactly what he was doing. Acts chapter 9, God reaches out to and touches the Apostle Paul. He transforms Saul into the Apostle Paul. And now God has someone who he's going to use to reach the entire Mediterranean world. He was a Roman citizen, spoke multiple languages, incredibly intelligent, dedicated. Um, and so God had the greatest missionary that the church essentially at that time could have. Friends, God always begins with one person. God wants to use you. He wants to use you to change an entire city like Paul did. We've seen three transitions so far in the book of Acts. First, there, were baptism, there was a baptism of thousands of people. Second, there were the baptism of priests. Many priests were baptized. Third, we see cross-cultural baptism uh, of individuals, the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, Acts 9.31 gives us the next transition, and that is that churches were multiplied. Check this out. Acts 9, verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were what? Multiplied. Now entire churches were multiplied. Not just the believers, but entire churches were multiplied. Friends, let me say something and listen close. It is not in God's plan that we have mega churches. Amen. Amen. What am I talking about? How can I so boldly say that? Friends, the biblical model is not that churches grow until they have thousands of seats for thousands of people, but that churches multiply. We've just seen it in the word of God. Churches are meant to multiply. And you become a mega church. And by the way, I grew up in a very large church. Our Adventist universities have very large churches and understandably so. I grew up in one, Pacific Union College. And let me just tell you, when, you, when you're in a church that large, you come to a point where there's not enough for people to actually do. People just become pew warmers, you know, like I was 
for many years there, not involved, not doing anything because it's just not, there's not much to be done because there are too many people and not enough things for us all to do. God's plan is not for us to have mega churches, but for us to multiply. A church plant is in the future for the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. We will plant a church by God's grace and with his help. Exactly where, when, and how, the Holy Spirit is yet to reveal to our leadership team. But it's not a matter of if we plant a church, but when. Why? Because we see in God's word, this is his will for us. This is his desire for us. Not to just um, grow and, you know, add another story onto our church and, you know, more seating. But no, God wants us to launch out and to multiply. Some may say, you know, Meriwether is too difficult. There's no Adventist presence in Meriwether. Uh, or downtown Newcastle has a, a culture that's incompatible with planting a church. Friends, there's only one place that God's church cannot grow, and that's where there is no people. Any place that God puts you, your church can grow. And friends, it's no coincidence that we are the only Adventist church near Newcastle, Meriwether, Broadmeadow, Adamstown, Islington, Carrington. But God wants new converts and new churches in all of these areas. Ours here in Hamilton, our church being here in Hamilton is not enough. It's not good enough. And friends, this is exciting because as we pray about the right time and location and, and way to launch out into our community, God's going to work in some amazing ways. And so we have much to look forward to. Acts chapter 10, we're going to have to fly a little faster here. God takes them beyond. He takes them to the heart of Europe where Cornelius is converted. Acts 11, it says in verses 20 and 21, it says, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. This is what was happening at Antioch, the first place where, we, where believers were called Christians. Acts 12, Peter is in prison, and the church prays, and he is delivered. What did the church do? Did they march with pickets and lobby against the government? What did they do? It says that they prayed. Acts 12, verse 5, listen to this. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Isn't that powerful? Constant prayer, consistent prayer. They were praying for Peter who was in prison. And the Bible says an angel came and he led Peter out from being chained between two guards. The guards were asleep. The angels made sure of that. Broke Peter free from those chains. The door swung open. The second door swung open. He went to the home of the believers and a girl named Rhoda went down and saw him and got so excited that she left him out at the gate and ran upstairs to tell everybody. But the people didn't believe her. And they said, no, you're beside yourself. You're out of your mind. Friends, sometimes when we pray for miracles from God, we're not ready to receive them. We're not ready to believe that they've actually happened. But in reality, we should say, shouldn't we be expecting this? We've been praying for this, right? And then they came down and realized it was Peter. And um, what an incredible miracle that deliverance was. Acts 14, they're in Iconium. Miracles are worked. The city is divided and they flee. They preach the word. Acts 15 is the first real clash, the conflict that the church had and worked through together. Um, Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 4 says, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who had believed, but his father was a Greek. And the Bible says that Paul took Timothy under his wing. And not because circumcision is a requirement, but because he didn't want it to be a stumbling block to the Jews, uh, Timothy was circumcised. And um, the Bible tells us that they went together and served the Lord. Verse 6 says Paul wanted to go to Asia and Bithynia. But it tells us in verse 6, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Amazing. Would you think that the Holy Spirit would actually forbid them to preach God's word anywhere? Why would the Holy Spirit tell them, no, you don't preach the word in Asia? Okay, time was not ready, yeah, and they were needed elsewhere at the time, right? Just verses afterward, the Bible says that God gives Paul a dream in verse 9, and a man from Macedonia stood and pled with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. 
There was the answer. The reason God closed this door was to open another. And friends, you will experience things in life, times in life, where you are fully surrendered to the leading of God in your life, and he slams the door shut. And you may not understand why. Let me just digress to share this. In 2018, I was going to propose to Sharissa. She knew it. And we were on a trip. God had opened up the door for us to both preach in neighboring countries in Europe and um, on the same weekend. And so we went over earlier with her sister and friend to, uh, to spend time in the Valley of the Walden Seas in northern Italy. And I was planning on proposing. And God very clearly slammed the door shut. And I was like, Lord, why? What, what's going on? I didn't propose. You're probably thinking, oh, he proposed and she said no. That wasn't the case. Um, but she knew I was going to propose, and we were both confused because we had prayed and fasted many times. We had sought the Lord's will to know if we were more effective together than apart, and God very clearly slammed the door shut. Friends, I think it was six weeks later, she was approached by the former conference president about working as prayer ministries coordinator here in this conference. He was a former professor of mine from Andrews University, and he said, we would have a place for Justin as well. Two weeks later, I already had a trip booked to come here. So I said, well, let's interview with them and see what happens. So we came and we walked into this sanctuary for the first time. You know what they told us? After we met the, the lovely elders uh, and the people, just three people who were here, they told us this church has the reputation of being the most difficult church in all of Australia. Um, there were about 40 people on average attending on a very high Sabbath with 60, sometimes was 20 or so. And some of you here were here at that time. And friends, we knew very clearly there was nothing wrong we could actually pick. Usually with jobs that are offered you, it's like, oh, this is good, this is good, that's bad, that's bad, and you kind of balance it out. But this, there was nothing bad we could actually think of, of the situation and of the offer. We prayed about it and sensed God leading this way and accepted the call and came here. But the amazing thing, and the reason I'm telling you this story is this. If I had proposed to Sharissa that two months before, as I wanted to, before God slammed that door shut, I would have purchased a fiancé visa for her to come to America, $7,000 or whatever it would have been, and she would have been planning to move there, to Central California where I was working. And we would have been, it would have been much more difficult for us to consider this job and this place and this option because we would have been focusing that direction. Friends, whenever God closes a door, he has a very good reason for it. And here's another thing. Sometimes he closes a door and, and we struggle with trusting him that he knows what he's doing. But we can trust God. Amen? It's not that he closes the door because he doesn't love us. He closes it because he loves us. And he's going to open a much better one. One that is his timing and his location and his purpose for us. Friends, we serve an amazing God. Chapter 17, Paul is going to Berea and Thessalonica, Corinth, Philipp, Philippi, and Athens. Acts 18, for over a year and eight months, Paul stays in Corinth. And he says, do not be afraid, Paul, but speak and do not keep silence. Friends, I want to say... If you're wanting to do something for God, just jump in. Don't hesitate. You know, by God's grace, next year around this time, we're going to be having a youth-led evangelistic series. Did you guys hear that? A youth-led evangelistic series where our young people will be preaching the Word of God and uh, sharing the Word of God. And, and those who will not be preaching are all still going to be involved in various ways with AV and with singing, with the various things that we do. Maybe you're a young person or you're not a young person and you feel like God is calling you to get involved, but you don't feel ready. If you wait until you feel ready, you will never do it. Don't wait until you feel ready. Measure what you do. Pray about it. Talk to somebody and assess if it is something you are capable of fulfilling, a responsibility that you are capable of fulfilling. And then do something um, yeah, do something for the Lord. Get involved, get active, do something for God. Set reasonable goals, but always stretch yourself a little bit. You know, we have this idea that sometimes we're just plateauing, we're just cruising in our spiritual life. There is no such thing as cruising in your spiritual life as a plateau. 
we are either growing, going uphill, or we're going downhill and we're dying. There is no such thing as a plateau spiritually. If you're not growing, you may not feel it, but you're dying. Get involved and it will help you to stay close to the Lord and be active in his work. Uh, Acts 19, Paul raises up a church in Ephesus. And I just want to share something briefly here before we fly to a close. Acts 19, Paul raises up the church in Ephesus. And this happens. This, this story blew my mind when I first heard it. I told my friend who told me this story. I said, what? That's in the Bible? And he's like, yeah, man, Acts 19, read it. I was like 19, 20 years old. Acts 19, it says in verse 11, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul. I shared this with you earlier. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. But there were some Jewish, itinerant Jewish exorcists who took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. But look at what they said. They said, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. So this is more than seven individuals. They're trying to cast a demon out of a man. And they say, "Eh, in in the name of Jesus, who that guy Paul preaches, come out of the man. Do you think this worked? Not at all. Listen, it says, verse 15, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. By the way, friends, this is the way that the devil always works, through shame and guilt. Nakedness leads to shame. Woundedness leads to pain. And and, um, so shame shame and guilt and pain. These are the ways that the devil operates. Now, this is an incredible thing. This, this man in whom this demon was jumped on them and beat up over seven people. Well, more than eight people, the Bible says. And they actually ran out of the house with their tails between their legs, so to speak, naked and ashamed. And look at the result. Verse 17. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. What was the result? Many who had believed came confessing their deeds. Also many, and Ephesus was very famous for its magic and witchcraft. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them. And it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Wow. Why do you think that the Bible includes that it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. Nothing in the Bible is by accident, right? So why would the Bible actually say, why would the Holy Spirit inspire them to count up how much these magic books that they burned were worth? Do you think it might have crossed their minds, ah, you know what, we could just sell these, and the money we could use it to give to God? Do you think that might have crossed the mind of at least one person? It could have, right? But they quickly would have realized, if this magic book has led me to, into sin, like this demon-possessed man had been, if this magic book has led me the wrong direction, if I sell it for money, I'm going to lead someone else in the wrong direction, right? And so the Bible actually counts the number, the amount of silver that these were worth to emphasize to us that God, God's church was not dependent upon the, this money in order to grow. It was also to point out that that no matter how valuable these magic books were, these people said, we need to burn these things. You know, when I was was 18 years old, and I actually heard this story, it was just a part of the story, the second half of the story. I immediately went home, and I grabbed my books that had magic in them. I didn't practice magic. I didn't do little incantations and, and that kind of thing. No. But I read books that had magic in them. Harry Potter, another series of, uh, you know, books in a, from a, a fantasy series in a world where there was lots of magic and all of these things. I grabbed those books. I stoked a fire in the fireplace. And I burned those books. Burned them. Gone. But that wasn't it. I grabbed some DVDs because I had purchased a lot of DVDs when I was a teen, mostly anime. 
um, Japanese animation that happens to have spiritualism in it and, and magic and witchcraft. And you know what I did with those DVDs? You think I sold them? No way. I shattered them. I broke them over a rubbish bin. Gone. Hundreds of dollars, by the way. It was a lot of money that I could have made. In fact, the devil works in funny ways. Like he, there was a girl who told me when I told her, oh, I'm going to be getting rid of these books of mine. It was a different book series, not Harry Potter, but a different one. She said, oh, those are worth a lot of money now. You could sell those and make, they were worth like seven times what I had paid for them a few years before. But the money meant nothing to me if it was going to be leading people away from Christ. Burned them. Broke the DVDs. And friends, let me tell you, I have never regretted that decision. I've never looked back. And I don't know if you might have things in your home. Maybe you're not doing incantations and those kinds of things, but you're reading books. You're playing games. You're watching DVDs that have magic in them. And it just seems innocuous and harmless. But friends... That is the very stuff that will lead us away from Christ. It's the very stuff that gives the devil access to us in our lives, to harass us and possess us through nightmares, through demonic possession or harassment in our homes, um, to mess with us. Friends, I want to invite you to do the same as those people did, because I'm so glad that I did the same. If you've got anything like that at home, don't look back. Get rid of it, burn it, break it, and don't look back. Acts, 20, Acts chapter 20, Paul ministers in Troas and Miletus. Acts 21, he ministers to tens of thousands of Jews, the Bible says. There were tens of thousands, murias is, is the word in Greek. Tens of thousands of those who believed. Acts 22 and 23, Paul is arrested and addresses a Jerusalem mom. And they send him to Felix, heading toward the end here. Acts 24, 25, and 26, we're going to have a whole sermon on this someday soon. Paul stands before kings, Agrippa, Felix, who almost were persuaded to become Christians. And then we have the end of the book of Acts. Paul makes a statement that is really his, his statement of his life, like his life commandment, essentially. What motivates him, what he lives for in verse 23, it says, When they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Paul dwelt in his own house, the Bible says in verse 28. And, and the book of Acts ends somewhat abruptly. You read the letters and the epistles and you read the gospels and there's this nice kind of conclusion at the end of the book where you know it's over and it's done, but not so with the book of Acts. Verse 28 says, uh, verse, sorry, verse 31, uh, 30, 31, last two verses of the book say this, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and the teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. No one forbidding him. Friends, Paul was called to preach and to proclaim the gospel, and each one of us is as well. And we see through his life the lesson that for God, there is no difficulty too big for him to overcome. There is no problem bigger than he is. Instead of telling people how big our problems are, we need to tell our problems how big our God is. Amen? And let him work in miraculous and amazing ways. The book of Acts ends very abruptly. Friends, I said I would share some things that we will be doing in the weeks to come. Just a quote, and I'll only share the first and last sentence. First Selected Messages 121 says, A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. Do you agree? True godliness means to be like God. Don't you think that's the greatest need that we have? It is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. A few sentences later, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. We cannot expect revival in our church and in our lives if we're not praying for it, if we're not spending time together praying for it. And friends, soon we will have a prayer meeting, a prayer group meeting in someone's home, no matter where you live in the Newcastle or Thornton or Maitland area, meeting once a week in your area to pray together. 
to pray together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for his healing of sick family members, for his working in our lives, to ask God to fill us with his spirit, to ask God to help us win our family and friends and coworkers for Christ, to ask God to work through our food pantry and pathfinders and adventures and all the other ministries of our church, and to ask God to make Pentecost happen again here in our church and in our community. Prayer and Bible study are so important, but service and outreach, without service and outreach, it's pointless. Christianity is about pouring our lives out for the lives of others. Jesus didn't give up bad things in order that we could be saved. Jesus gave up good things so that others could be saved. You may have to give and look at your schedule and say, you know what, this isn't a bad thing, but if it's taking away from what God wants me to do with my time, I'm willing to give it up. I'm willing to even give up good things in order to do things that will lead others to an eternity with Christ. Without outreach, the arteries of the hearts become clogged. There's a banquet, a spiritual banquet, where we feed on God's word every Sabbath. But if we don't share what we learn, just like eating without exercise, we'll become obese. We'll become spiritually obese without getting involved. Friends, just closing, in closing, the book of Acts, the ending, ending so abruptly as it does, implies that the, the story of Acts is not finished. Did you catch that? Stay with me here as we wrap up. The story of the book of Acts, it didn't end with chapter 28. The reason it ends so abruptly is because God's desire is that the book of Acts be continued. And when we get to heaven, you know, all of Acts, the sermon is called All of Acts. The book of Acts just records what God saw fit to record for us. But there's so much more that happened that we don't know about and we won't know about until we get to heaven. And in the millennium, it's going to be amazing to hear about all of Acts, all of the stories of what took place. But you know what? The people who were there in the New Testament church are going to come to you and say, oh, okay, I've shared enough. What about you? What happened in your life at the end of time? When, when the latter rain was poured out, and it was even mightier than Pentecost, when Pentecost happened again with intensified power, I want you to tell me about that. Friends, that is going to be incredible. Today, my question to you is, as we've seen that, that the early church made it a priority to make God their number one priority, are you willing to say today, Lord, I realize in some form or another, I am not making you the number one priority in my life, with my time, with my energy. You may be doing a pretty good job, but even if there's some area of your life where you realize you could be giving more to God and putting him first, and you want to say today, Lord, I truly want you to be number one in my life. I want to invite you to stand. Standing to say, God, I want to put you first for my family, for myself, for your kingdom, for your church, for your glory. Praise God. Maybe there is a specific way that the Lord has impressed you in the last days, weeks, months, maybe just this morning, that he wants you to be involved, to give more of your time and your energy to our church here at Hamilton as we reach out to our community, as we minister to those within our walls in the next 12 months. Maybe God has laid it on your heart for a specific area already, but maybe he hasn't yet, but you're willing. And you're willing to say, Lord, I'm going to pray for direction about where you want me to focus my time in the next year. But God, I'm willing to give more of my time to serve you because I want to see Pentecost happen again. If that's your prayer and you're willing to say, God, I want to serve you with more of my time and energy this year, I'm not going to ask you to share what it is, but if that's your commitment to God, I want to invite you to raise your hand to say, God, I'm giving more of my time, more of my energy to serve you this upcoming year. Praise the Lord. Last of all, as we draw to a close, we have an amazing, amazing ministry here at our church. We have, as you've heard me say, two worship services every week, Sabbath morning at 11 o'clock and Thursday at 3.30, right there in our food pantry. We have, we have between 45 and 60 people coming then, 
and between 45 and 60 coming on Friday down in Hamilton South. If you told someone that we had a worship service that was 50 people every single week who came with about three from our church regularly who come, um, and this was a group of people who were hungry and wanted friendship, and our, uh, our local member of parliament even visited our worship service, with that high of a percentage of non-believers, most people wouldn't believe you. They'd say, that's, that's crazy, that's impossible. With our community meal that happens afterward now, we need you. We need more people. We realize you can't, some cannot come every week. We realize some cannot even come once a month because you have a locked in Thursday commitment at work that goes beyond 6.30 p.m. But if you are willing to say, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a month, maybe it's once a year to take that very special specific time off. If you're willing to say, Lord, I realize this ministry needs more hands and more help and more people who can befriend those who come through its doors. And Lord, I'm willing, no matter how often it is, are you willing to raise your hand today? Even if it's once in the next year that you go, once a week, once a month, once in the next year, coming to pantry to support, to be a part of it, to help befriend those who come from our community. God bless you, friends. Praise God. Father in heaven, we are so excited about what you are going to do. We're so blessed to see what you are doing already in our church, what you have done. But we know that it's just a drop in the bucket compared to what you want to do this year and in the months and years following that. Lord, grant us wisdom so that we can be like the church of the book of Acts, committed to prayer, committed to the proclamation of your word, and Lord, most of all, may we make you our number one priority in our lives. Because this world is not all there is, Lord. We realize that Jesus is coming soon. And that this life is short, it's brief. And Lord, that, that soon, eternity will be a reality. And we want to see as many people there as possible. Lord, thank you for the commitments that have been made today. You've seen our hands, you know our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that as we... Um, enjoy this fellowship lunch now together. That you would bless the food, bless those who prepared it, and bless our conversations. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. We will just sing the first verse of our last song, I'll Go Where You Want Me to Go, as our commitment uh, to the Lord.
Father in heaven, thank you so much. This is the prayer of our hearts. And may it not be our prayer right now as we are standing here together only, but Father, may it continue to be the prayer of our hearts and the motto of our lives that we will go where you want us to go. We will be where you want us. Um, we will be who you want us to be by the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we give ourselves to you, Lord, and we wait expectantly and excitedly for what you will do. We love you, we praise you, and we pray that you would bless our fellowship now together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.